Not enough people know that Mort Saul really was the first conversationalist comic in the post-World War II era in the United States. He paved the way for Lenny Bruce, George Carlin, Richard Pryor, Woody Allen, and all the rest of the people that poked fun, made satirical comments about our society, our politics, our culture, and, and tried to advance thought. Not so much to get yucks and tell the same jokes that you wrote out and have honed and told over and over and over again with precision, but actual commentary that would make you think and take steps forward. And Mort's Hall, I think, really is not recognized. This episode of Later with Bob Costas from May 20th, 1991, addresses his career, his relevance, political correctness, cancel culture, being able to say what you want, and the clamping down of, upon freedom of speech that he and Lenny Bruce and Carlin fought for in some cases and certainly spoke about. But we, we've got a whole generation of, of comics going all the way from, you know, through Bill Hicks and Dave Chappelle and certainly this week Chris Rock talking about getting smacked upside the head by uh, Will Smith. So, so kudos, Mort Saul. Thanks for staying up later. Mort Saul returns tonight from Los Angeles. He was with us in New York about a year and a half ago. We talked about his beginnings at the Hungry Eye, about Lenny Bruce, and a number of other topics. And I was sorry the half hour ran out, so we got another 30 minutes here. Good, but As a person who's made his living and his reputation doing political satire, is this as good a time Yeah, it's always as good, others? but you have, to, you have to look to yourself. You can't really blame the audience or blame the president who uh, is a friend of mine of sorts, but you can't, you can't blame them. You've got to look to yourself and find, uh, find a way to say it. In other words, the big night when he got up with the State of the Union address and, and he said, he said uh, President Bush said, up in the balcony there, there's, there's Mrs. Colin Powell and, there, and there's, there's my wife and there's Brenda Schwarzkopf and everybody was on their feet cheering. That would seem like a bad time to be in the opposition. The only thing you could do is get up and say, gee, it's family night in Washington, <laughs> if not in uh, Baghdad. That's what you'd have to do. You'd have to, you'd have to find a way to look at the underside. Is there anybody out there among the young comics that you think has uh, some sort of political point of view? I don't think they're, they're too interested in it, which is okay. I don't quarrel with that. I just don't think it's a terribly... Uh, a politically uh, ridden uh, generation. Uh, they, they didn't come from radical parents. They're not into that. I mean, sometimes they, they're traditionally liberal. But you know what that's all about. I mean, uh, the other night I saw, on The Tonight Show, I saw Jay Leno commending Sissy Spacek because she made a movie with Whoopi Goldberg, and he said it was politically correct. Well, the problem is, can we tolerate movies that aren't politically correct? I mean, what if a good movie comes from South Africa? Can we indulge it because it's a good movie? Those are, uh, I think those are things that, uh, you know, that you have to, you have to get into, but it's got to have some bite. I'd like to see somebody do a sketch, for instance, where a guy comes back and he says, I was just with Bob Hope in the Gulf and, and I was inspired. He said, what did you get out of it? I got two shots on The Tonight Show and I'm opening at the Hollywood Bowl and <laughs> go for it. You know, go for it. One thing that the new guys opened up, especially, was that the American public will accommodate more savagery. So if there's going to be some bloodletting, let, let it be positive. Yeah, there are some bloodletting in terms of, uh, of using prominent people as targets for cultural barbs or, uh, yeah. or making fun of some aspect of their personality or, uh, or their sensibility, but it doesn't always have a political context to it. In fact, it seldom has. Well, yeah, exactly. Most of that is, is jealousy. I mean, you've got Joan Rivers is, is mad at the girls that are prettier than she is, and the comedians are mad at people that are more powerful than they are or who are incumbents when they want to be incumbents. There's a re you got to have a reason to elect the guy rather than he wants the other guy's job. But it's really the humanity behind it. It's the, it's the humanity behind it. Eventually, you've got to trust the guy. It's not his politics. Politics, at least. Is there some sort of 
uh, of political undertone, even if it's not stated, to what, let's say, Dennis Miller does on the weekend update on Saturday Night Live, do you think? Well, I know him. I don't think even he would say it has a political undertone. I don't think that's his intention. It's, um, it's more in the area of uh, gossip. You get together with the guys and you have a beer and you talk about who's in the news. But I don't think he's politically oriented. I don't think it's his, that's his primary uh, area of interest. Which is okay. That's fine. How about Letterman, who's anything but political? In fact, uh, no. if, if someone speaks for 30 seconds without a laugh, David gets uncomfortable and has, to, and has to puncture that. And yet, is there some kind of statement within what he does, some kind of rejection of the plastic nature of much of television, how absurd it all is, yeah. what a pose it all is, uh, these GE weasels, whatever he might be talking about, even though there's no specific political frame of reference, in the end, is that a statement that he's made that's, that's political without his intending it to be? It's hard to believe when I see what he says and what he attributes to Robert, the fictional Robert Wright, who's one of the leading members of the show. Uh, when I remember that the, uh, the first couple of times I was on NBC, I had some innocuous joke in 56 about uh, if the government sues Je General Motors in an antitrust action, General Motors will become uh, angry and cut them off without a cent, and he took the joke out. The producer, Bob Finkel, was having a heart attack on the Perry Como show. So uh, we've come a long way. Now. I think, I th but basically getting back to your question, I think Letterman grew up in a generation where television prevailed. It was like a, a foot on his Adam's apple as an American. And he's saying, how could you have abdicated your rights and signed over the proxy to the three major networks? And just because I'm a, a recipient of the largesse, it doesn't blind me to the fact that this is worthless. <laughs> I hear him saying that again and yeah. again. Yeah. And that is a political statement. Oh, yeah. And, and done with humor. How I'm, about a guy like Carlin? You were instrumental early in Carlin's career. He used there was, to do a great imitation of me. There was a period of time uh, between Jack Parr and Johnny Carson where they were running on-air auditions, in effect, for uh, Parr's successor. And for a while, you hosted The Tonight Show, and you brought the young George Carlin on. Now, he was a whole lot different at that point, especially in appearance, yeah. than the way we think of George Carlin today. But you must have seen something in him. Well, he was very dedicated, and he was, he was sharp, and he was, he was fast, and, uh, and he wanted it. <laughs> I, uh, I'm working at Basin Street East here in New York, and a couple blocks away is George Carlin, who's working at the living room. And uh, we have a kind of a cultural exchange going on, and uh, the audience is caught in between. I went over to see him the other night, and I was very impressed, as I have been for the last couple of years. And uh, I thought that uh, he ought to reach a lot more people. That's one of the virtues of television, and I'm going to let him speak for himself. George, go. George Carlin, thank, thank you. The foremost member of the New School, and this is not a mutual admiration society per se, is, of course, Mort Salt. Mort. Right, that's uh, right. Well, basically, it's a dichotomy of guilt and society we're concerned with, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> How well did you know Woody Allen when he was doing stand-up stuff? Extremely well. He, uh, he says uh, in the biography by uh, Eric Lax, he says, more, more changed my life. He said he, he showed me that the structure of the joke could be changed. It was liberating. And when I come to New York, he's usually there the first night. He's the first guy, no matter where I am, theater, club, anything. And uh, I put him into the, the hungry eye and the, the crescendo in, in Hollywood, that is the interlude, at the smaller club upstairs. and. Uh, Mr. Kelly's in Chicago. Yeah, I knew him. Cavett and he used to come in. We used to get him in without paying the, the cover at the Copa. When I worked at the Copa, I go where, you know, sane men fear to, to tread, the Copa. I wanted to prove, you know, that everybody's going to listen to this stuff and like it. How did they receive you there? Pretty well. You got you to look to yourself. You know, see, I wasn't like the jazz guys. The jazz guys are in a group, the trio or a quartet. If the audience doesn't like it, they go outside and they drink together and they commiserate and they, they, uh, they agree that it's the audience's fault. I never had anybody. I had to find a way to get to the audience. So I found a way. I found a way with the material. If they're not listening, there's, there's something wrong. You know, maybe the message is good, but you're addressing them like a siren. Maybe you shouldn't. Carlin got thrown off the stage once at the Copa, maybe for being directly profane. Now, what tact did you take? Because I'm guessing late 50s, early 60s, the average crowd at the Copa is just not attuned to your political sensibilities. Well, they, they'd get mad if you said anything good about the police. You know, it was that kind of crowd. 
good fellas. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so, so uh, that's when they would censor you. It's only when you stepped into their little province, you got out of line in their little province. I found a way to do it. I had some, I had some certain jokes that were sure fire and were less convoluted than my other jokes. Although I'm generally drawn to something you have to work through. I think it's worth it, you know, to do something that... And then my fans, of course, are always brought down if I do something that's easy, that's a joke joke. You know, they, they always hate that. But joke jokes occur to you occasionally. You now, know? what's wrong with peppering uh, it's nothing wrong with a monologue it's a with the occasional one that helps you get over the hump, that helps the timing? It's a great strategy to keep everybody going, and keep it going. Are you a little disappointed that Woody Allen does nothing besides movies, and 95% of them, although he was in the Mazursky movie recently, 95% would be his own movies. There's no quarreling with the general quality uh, of those movies, but would you like to see him uh, on stage doing stand-up? Would you like to see him in a in what you call a populist medium like television occasionally and just working off the seat of his pants? Well, you can't get in another guy's, another guy's skin. I don't think he enjoyed performing that much. It was a lot of anxiety by his own admission about acceptance. You know the thing about live, they can, they can shoot you down after 40 years and one night they can destroy your ego. But, uh, I mean, he's gotten a lot of renown uh, for what he's done. I don't know how satisfying it is to be insulated from the audience. He might have a better time if he went out there. I run into him occasionally, you know, at Elaine's. And then Mia always stops to talk. Oh, he tells me so much about you, I'd like to talk. And he's pulling her out the front door, you know, you know the recluse. I had a dream the other night, you know, after he said I, I changed his life. He reads a review, a knocking scenes from a wall, and he calls me and says, can you change my life back again? Oh, guru. <laughs> I haven't seen him in a long time. I. Uh, it's amazing, you know, we all probably need each other more than ever, but there's a terrific atomization in America. We, we don't talk to each other. Every time we do, everybody's happy. Whether I talk to Redford or Sidney Pollack or Clint Eastwood, they say, boy, it's great to talk. We gotta do this again. They say, how about tomorrow? I say, geez, I don't know, tomorrow's bad. How about Monday? No, Monday I'm going to con. Tuesday, it, it's something that happened to all of us. Um, we were, uh, we were richer when we were poorer. Well, I won't look at a cat like my Back now with Mort Saul. How do you view the 90s state of affairs and the battle of the sexes? <laughs> well, it does go on. One of the segments we're going to do on the, on the television show for the monitor, I'm going to do a modern day version of the Honeymooners. That's what I hope to do. I hope to find a, a lady actress in Boston and do the strain of a modern marriage today. I think a guy who beats his breast and says, kill me for it, but I love my wife, is going to have a tough time making that stick. Uh, the women have bought into uh, a lot of the poison. They, 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 I'm a person, too. There's an awful lot of that. They were getting close to that in the movies, the humor of the man-woman situation in some of that 50s angst that Woody was doing and Elaine May and all. They were getting close to it, but I think eventually everybody wrote it off as Jewish anxiety, urban American Jewish anxiety. It's more than that. I think the real, the real alien thing is between the sexes. Haven't you occasionally been accused by people who otherwise would more or less <laughs> share your political agenda of not being politically correct when it comes to feminism? Yeah, that's true. That's true. Probably, it's probably a misnomer because we're the, you know, uh, we're the real romantics. Those of us who insist on, on loving them are the ones who are eventually disappointed, you know? I mean, uh, a guy that passes for a feminist is a guy who says, uh, you know, I've, I met a dynamite lady. She's got her own job, her own condo in the marina, and her own uh, Audi. I haven't had to call her in seven months. That's not a guy who really wants to put his arm around a girl and, uh, and take care of her. If well, you can, what you just said right there, though, is what some feminists would object to. What, take care of her? Yeah, take care of her. Well, I would say, uh, I, I, I think that, um, um, uh, well, no, I won't go that far. <laughs> no, go ahead. Go that far. Whatever it is, go that far. The, uh, the 70s and 80s are going to be remembered primarily not for Reagan and Bush, not for the Gulf War. They're going to be remembered for the feminization of men and the masculinization of women. 
And I got to tell you, girls, you really make second-class guys. You hold, ought to hold out for what you are, which is mysterious. But, but to a certain extent, not all the way to where the differences are completely blurred, but to a certain extent, maybe men could stand to be feminized a little bit, and maybe women could stand to be more assertive. And in the end, the hysterical extremes are always weeded out. You know, every talk show, every Oprah, every Donahue has a shrill feminist who'll come on and say, all women are victims, all sex is rape, you think you love your husband, you think you love your boyfriend, but he's really patronizing you at best and victimizing you at worst. And most people, reasonable people, listen to this and say, somewhere in there, there's a tiny amount of truth that I ought to pay attention to, and the rest is this particular person's alienation and anger, and so I'll cast that out. And in the end, there's kind of a filtering process, and what's worthwhile lasts and gets incorporated into the larger culture, and then the other, then the crazy people go off and find another talk show to be on. You can only have a successful relationship unless you want to be unhappy. Want to be happy with a woman, you got to find a girl who settled things with her father, forgave him for his inadequacies, and forgot him. Didn't want to execute him for them uh, as a capital crime. Uh, yeah, in other words, and you've got to get a woman. Women are going to wind up in this country watching the late show alone because they're they're uneducated, unanalyzed, and they're going to be unloved. That's the ultimate destiny. They really got to look at themselves. The step up. That is, the step in equality to us is a step down, it's not a step up. Is what you're saying the only way to be loved is to be June Allison? Is that what I said? <laughs> That's not what I said. No, not at all. But remember... Not that June Allison isn't lovable. I don't want to get a letter Jack from Kennedy her said. Jack Kennedy said the best writer he knew was Barbara Tuckman. He didn't say it's the best girl writer I know. They don't have to. People that stand alone don't have to join groups. When I used to go to the campuses, when a guy came up and he, he was head of, uh, 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 you know, the Black Studies uh, group, or a girl was running the feminist, it was somebody who had no identity otherwise. I find that strong individuals don't like groups, especially myself. The groups don't do it for you. Brought to you by came up. The 1961 Oscars went with five co-hosts, yeah. and you were one of them. Who are the others, you remember? Lawrence Olivier, Jerry Lewis, Bob Hope, Tony Randall. We did a half hour each. Well, if it had been done in Paris, it would have made sense, because Jerry Lewis <laughs> is the Lawrence Olivier of France. Every, Otherwise, it's a strange combination. Well, what did, what did uh, Jefferson say? Every man has two countries, France and his own. Jerry Lewis has one country. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, yeah, you know, uh, Jerry Wald produced that. You recall him, Bob, producer? Uh -uh. And uh, Jerry was a terrific guy. He'd been a columnist in the New York Post, you know. Went to Winchell for advice when he was a copy boy. I want to be a columnist. How can I develop a style? Winchell said, if, you're, if they don't know you, attack somebody who's famous. So in his first column, I understand, he attacked Winchell. <laughs> <laughs> He's a terrific guy. If you had, yeah, wonderful guy. So I, I, I was very proud to work for him. He brought you uh, Joanne Woodward, Martin Ritt as a director, Tony Francioso, Lee Remick, Paul Newman. He was a very open-headed guy, Peyton Place. Anyway, so Jerry produced the awards, and they were in black tie at the Pantages Theater, Hollywood Boulevard. Uh, not black tie, white tie and tails. Nobody owned white tie and tails except David Niven and Clark Gable. Niven made my tie. He tied it for me himself. And uh, when we went to rent the, the tails, I went down with William Holden and John Wayne. I remember that day. And I remember how uncommonly humane and egalitarian they were. Terrific guys. And then um, uh, I was introduced by Sophia Loren and Dean Martin. I remember she said, here's a guy who's breaking in his evening clothes as well as his material. <laughs> and I went on and I did a routine about an actor who's come out here from New York, a snob one of Lee Strasberg's boys, and he holes up in the Chateau Marmont, an actor's hotel, and he only goes out at night furtively to a 24-hour market. He buys one Coke and some Woolite to rinse out his socks in the sink at the hotel. And the clerk says, this is going to cost you just as much. Don't you want a six-pack? And the guy says, no, I might be going back to New York. He's a purist. <laughs> and I did a joke about MacArthur and Hatta Hopper wrote in the LA Times the next day that Tom Moore, the president of ABC, should see that I am, quote, blacklisted. Um, because I had uh, defamed MacArthur, a very tame joke. He walked through the water. Why didn't he walk on the water going into the Philippines? And, but I remember 
I, I, uh, I remember about the show uh, what a great time we had, and I've got to tell you, in retrospect, being up in the peanut gallery looking at Gary Cooper and Gable and Hope, if you will, I had more of a rush than I have walking through the middle and having some poor lonely person run up and ask for an autograph now who lives for those moments, hardly lives. Uh, Hope, by the way, uh, followed me. When he followed me, he said, this is great. See, this is what I mean about good humor. When, when you really state the case, Hope said, there he goes, Mort Saul, the favorite comedian of nuclear physicists everywhere. <laughs> well, they come out in sight to write a note to get the money. So they uh, pull, picked out this piece of paper, and they looked around, and they took out these ballpoint pens, and uh, wrote down, they wrote, uh, this is a holdup. Keep your mouth shut. If you act normal, you will not be harmed. And they shoved that under the cage, and the teller, this college man, looked at it, and he could have given them the money then and there, but uh, being a college graduate, he wanted to express himself in some sense. We've all felt that, right? And uh, perhaps write a rebuttal. So he thought about it, and he turned their note over, and he wrote back, and he said, uh, I just read your note demanding that I act normal, and uh, why, why not define your terms? I mean, after all, who knows? So then they got his note, and they wrote back to him, and they said, Listen, wise guy, just because you enjoyed certain economic advantages, peculiar. <laughs> Those were good times, but I don't want you ever to think I dwell on nostalgia, Bob. You know, my friend Stan Kenton said uh, he wouldn't even play the old tunes that people requested him. He said, nostalgia's cancer. There's only one direction, and that's uh, a straight ahead. Because there's only hope in the future. That's the only place hope resides. You look back and you think of, of all the mistakes you made when you were dumb or callow or had infantile values. You can look ahead, you know, and hope eventually you'll have some wisdom, and you'll understand, and you'll be in love, and you'll do good work, which I think is the ultimate redemption. Accommodations furnished by the Universal City Hilton and Towers. Make your next stay in Los Angeles a memorable one with our spacious rooms, international cuisine, and the attention of a friendly, experienced staff. Mort Saul's back on television on the Monitor Channel out of Boston this spring and on the road here and there. We've got to hit the road ourselves. See you later. Thanks, Bob.